Happy Tuesday evening, everyone. Welcome aboard. We are beginning our endeavors into the book of Exodus and uh, had a pretty good run through Genesis. Um, got to start up a YouTube channel where all those things are uh, uploaded and ready for uh, review if um, for whatever reason you share this or uh, uh, something happens, you can't access it on Facebook, on my page, or just gets lost in the shovel. Uh, then they're all um, up on Facebook, I mean uh, up on YouTube, and uh, put into a nice, neat little playlist for you. So, Brian, Mom, welcome aboard. Uh, so if you get a chance to go there, it's uh, Swordmaster Publications. You'll see the logo there with the sword running through both words. And uh, all of the uh, Genesis videos that we've done plus a few others that I've posted up. And um, uh, anyway, uh, thank you to all of those of you who have uh, joined me thus far. And I'm looking forward to getting into uh, Exodus and the rest of uh, the books of law. Hey, Rosalind, welcome aboard. <clears throat> a couple of interesting things tonight is going to happen. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of skip ahead for a moment. Uh, I'm not going to stay too far ahead but I just wanted to because of, of where we are and because I really like to get the timeline down uh, just in my own mind then um, for for me it's uh, good to just kind of map things out chronologically hey Aaron welcome aboard <clears throat> so I'm going to jump ahead to chapter six here in a moment uh, just for a couple of verses and then we'll come back to uh, chapters one and, and two so uh, anyway, I'll be reading out of the King James. I have the ESV open for some modern English when we need it and uh, access to the Hebrew uh, as that comes up as well. So give a couple more seconds here for some people to, to join us and then um, we will get started. Uh, also, uh, I've been... As I've been doing this this uh, set of videos for the last month or so, uh, I've been trying to work through times and stuff, and uh, just the way that, that my kids go to bed, my twins are a little bit older now, uh, and so um, we decided to ex extend their stay up time another 30 minutes, and so um, for that reason, uh, 9.30 kind of has to be a hard time for me to start. I've tried to start a little bit earlier. Um, but just 9.30 is just going to be the best time for me. Um, everything's quiet. The twins are in bed. Karis is up here with me, calm. Uh, she has a different bedtime because she's Karis. <laughs> so, hey, David, welcome aboard. We're starting our study in the book of Exodus tonight. So glad to have you. Tracy, glad to see you again. Um, so anyway, we'll be in uh, Exodus chapter 1. And uh, like I said, we've got a little bit of an interesting... Uh, Kind of interlude here that, that we'll be uh, coming across in just a moment. So let's get started with verse 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. So remember, there were 66 that came <clears throat> um, that were uh, descendants of Jacob directly. Uh, and then on top of that, we had wives, we had um, servants and, and whatever. So we're well over 100 people that came. Uh, and then they were there uh, for the last five years of the famine. And then uh, for 12 years beyond that, Jacob was still alive. He passed away 17 years after uh, they had come into Egypt. And then uh, Joseph was there and was able to uh, see his great-grandchildren of Ephraim. And so uh, that's an extended period of time. But I got to tell you, uh, growing up, and just just through media and just all of the the ambient information that that had come my way for the longest time. Hey Tom, welcome aboard. Uh, I had thought that there was this time where uh, Joseph brought everybody into Egypt, 
and they were there for, I don't know, 100, 200 years or so. And then uh, this new Pharaoh rises up. And they're well past the time period when, when Joseph was there. And it just, it just, for me, had always felt like this, this huge period of time that the, there were generations of Hebrew that were there as slaves. And that's not the case. They were actually not slaves for very long. If you look at it, Joseph is alive up until his great grand, he gets to see his great grandsons. Um, and then you have, uh, he passes away, and then you have a rise of a new Pharaoh. We're going we're gonna to read about that. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you that they're just not there for very long at all. Okay. So uh, Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. So everybody's gone. Um, all, all of the 12 brothers and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. So uh, in my understanding, this is a, a change in the dynasty. There, this is not a, uh, a Pharaoh that was the son of the one that was friends with Joseph. Um, this is a complete transition here, and he didn't know Joseph. He didn't. He didn't respect Joseph and what Joseph had done for Egypt, and so he he has a different outlook on the Hebrew people. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. All right, so Pharaoh, this new Pharaoh comes along and he, he doesn't know anything about Joseph. And for me, that was always uh, a transition of generations that had, that had taken place. And that's not the case. So I want, to, I want to go over to Exodus 6. And I've already mentioned this before. Um, but if you go to Exodus 6 and you go to verse 16, it says, These are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generation. Gershon and Kohath, and I told you to remember that name, Kohath and Merari, and the, uh, the years of the life of Levi were 130 and 7 years old. And then in verse 18, it says, And the sons of Kohath, Amram, and Izhar, and Hebron, and Uziel, and the years of the life of Kohath were 133 years. Then in verse 20, And Amram took him Jacobed, his father's sister to wife, so his aunt, and she bare him who? Aaron and Moses. So we go from Levi to Kohath to Amram to Moses. Four generations. Levi wasn't even, he didn't even spend his entire life there. Kohath didn't spend his entire life in Egypt. Both of those men came into Egypt with Jacob. And so when Kohath is there, he has Amram. Amram marries Jacobeth and they have Aaron and Moses. So this slavery period that I thought, you know, well, we kind of get this idea uh, if you watch like the movie Prince of Egypt or whatever. The, the implication that we see there is that they're there for the slaves for a very, very long time. And it isn't the case. It's actually uh, the case that, that Pharaoh is there and uh, he is he's ruler for a long time and he. Uh, it's just one, it, it, it's essentially boils down to like one generation that they're there as slaves. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, you know, I had heard my whole youth uh, on into college, it was 430 years that they were there in Egypt as slaves. <clears throat> I even have an article up on my, on my uh, uh, Swordmaster webpage that says 430 years of slavery. And it makes this point. I've had it up for a while. Um, but the idea that they were there for 430 years is just not correct. It's actually that, that starting with the promise to Abraham, way, way, way back in Genesis uh, 15, that's when the 430 years starts. You have, you have a 200 and, and something year period where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, are doing their thing. And then Jacob moves into Egypt. And then there's another roughly uh, not even 200 years where they're there, Joseph is there for uh, 
a while, a long enough to see his great grandkids, and then he dies right after all of the all of that generation is gone. A new Pharaoh rises up, and here you have Moses. Now, Moses is there for forty years. He he is raised and is is a um, a prince uh, for forty years. So they are there for a time, but. Uh, it's not nearly as long as what I thought it was, um, uh, I guess, back in the day. So, all right, back to Exodus chapter 1. <clears throat> so verse 11 says, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. Uh, again, if you watch Prince of Egypt or you watch uh, the Charlton Heston uh, movie, The Ten Commandments, um, there are, these are media presentations, um, and they're not bad. I, I have enjoyed both of those movies. I grew up watching Ten Commandments with my folks, and um, you know, uh, Prince of Prince of Egypt is, is a movie I've seen a number of times. Uh, so they're they're okay for what they are, but they're they're not accurate to every detail, and we can't we can't view those things as if they are uh, uh, inspired or. Uh, authoritative in any way we, we just have to be careful we, we when we look at, at movies entertainment type stuff um, because they're going to use their artistic license to embellish and so for me in, in both of those movies Ramses is the name of, of Pharaoh but that's not what we see in the Bible the, the word Ramses is uh, applied to a, a city or a, a place in um, the uh, uh, okay, uh, in the land where uh, the Israelites were, uh, the land of Goshen where the Israelites were brought into, uh, and uh, we'll see later when they're leaving, I think in Exodus chapter 12, that they uh, leave out of Ramses. It's, it's, it's the name of a city, and here we have the name of a city. Um, it is not the name of Pharaoh. Hey, Buck, welcome aboard. Uh, so just to kind of keep that straight, uh, I don't have a name in scripture for Pharaoh. Hey, Lisa, welcome aboard. Uh, we don't know from from scripture what Pharaoh's name is. And uh, so just, just to keep those things straight and just to kind of point out, um, you know, be aware of, of what you're watching. Uh, just, just from a, a sense of detail and stuff. So, um, of course... <laughs> Both of those, I think, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston and then uh, with uh, the Prince of Egypt were faithful enough that, that I don't have any major issues with them. I don't think they were trying to be sly or sneak in anything. Uh, they were not nearly as bad or off as the debacle that was Noah. Oh, my goodness. If you, if you want to avoid a really, really bad interpretation, uh, a movie interpretation of, of the Bible... Just don't bother with Noah. It was it was so awful. Um, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> verse twelve. But they the the more they afflicted him, uh, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. So they were really harsh with them. They they just for whatever reason the Egyptians were already had a had a bit of a um, a racist streak in them anyway. Remember it was an abomination for them to eat uh, at the same table uh, with the Hebrew, and so there's there's something of a hint of that already in the in the previous Pharaoh's reign. But here um, this new Pharaoh was like, you know, the the Hebrew hadn't done anything to them, nothing. Um, to warrant his fear, but he looks at him. He sees their great number. He knows that they're not, um, they're they're not the same as his people. And so he's like, well, you know what? Instead of letting them just keep growing, he didn't see their blessing as a thing that blessed his nation. He saw them as a, a potential threat. And so he takes uh, preemptive action and tries to uh, enslave them and, and use them. So, uh, verse 15, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other uh, Pua. So there's these two women that, that are there with the Hebrews, uh, and they're, I guess they're the main ones. They're, they're the two that are responsible for being the midwives for all the Hebrew. 
And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to, to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then, then she shall live. Hey, wife. <laughs> nice. Um, so what, what this is saying, is, uh, the, the phrase upon the stools, is, is basically when, when they're about to give birth. Uh, before before the child comes out, uh, what they're saying is is Pharaoh is telling them, uh, if you see that it's a son, uh, basically I want you to perform an abortion. That's that that's essentially what this is. Um, and if it's a daughter, then go ahead and let her be born. Um, and you're going to see here that that the midwives make up an excuse why they weren't why they weren't complying uh, to to indicate that that's what was happening. <clears throat> So verse 17, but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, but they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. So what they're saying, what, what their excuse was is that, you know, the Hebrew women are hardy. They're, they're uh, vigorous and, and they're, um, uh, you know, once they go into labor, boom, they're in and out and it's, it's done that, you know, by the, by the time we get there, by the time they call us and we show up, the baby's already born. And so they don't have the opportunity to do what, what Pharaoh had commanded them to do. And so, um, Pharaoh wasn't happy with them, but God, uh, was very pleased that the, the, uh, midwives were not killing the children. And so, um, uh, in uh, verse 20, it says, therefore, God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. So they're still growing all this time. Yes, yes. And uh, very grateful for them. Um, the, the, the women who uh, are standing up for life like that, uh, you know, you, Heather, being one of those, uh, have a great deal of respect for. So, hey, Royce, welcome aboard. Um but anyway, God was very pleased with them. And so it came to pass that the midwives feared God that he made them houses. Um, and that word houses there is not um, physical dwelling places. It's talking about families. So he blessed the families of uh, those midwives. And, and those midwives had uh, really big families because of it. They were, they were blessed by, because they protected children. They were given a lot of children of their own. Uh, which was a blessing to them. Um, I guess they uh, weren't weren't too worried about uh, staying home with them and homeschooling the whole time during some pandemic or something. Uh, I see a lot of people going crazy out there uh, right now, so we have to we have to reach out and help those people and um, maybe uh, give them some relief. But um, anyway, uh, it was a blessing for them, and God had blessed them because uh, they they chose life um, over over Pharaoh. Uh, you know, what is, what is, uh, uh, Peter say in Acts chapter five, we ought to obey God rather than men. And so that's the same, uh, tact, uh, our tactic that these, uh, these women did, you know, we're going to, we're going to choose God over men. So, uh, right. Midwives, doulas, uh, any, any of those who are, um, pro women, pro children, pro life, those kinds of things this is what I'm talking about there. So. Uh, and Pharaoh char charged all of his people, verse 22, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. So he's done with the whole subterfuge thing. You know, he, he tried to do it subtly with the midwives and just make it look like there wasn't, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't a command from him. Uh, because he's afraid of them. He's afraid of their number. He's afraid of their strength. Uh, the Hebrew people are a hardy people. They're, they're shepherds. They... They're outdoors, and and uh, you know the there was probably a lot of truth in what the two midwives said that that the women of the Hebrew hey Taylor welcome aboard were hardier than the Egyptian women. You can imagine, especially like a Pharaoh's household, these kind of prissy little princess types. We're gonna get to Pharaoh's daughter um, here in a minute, and uh, it's um, it's kind of the case that that that's just how it was that these are these are what we call the country folk you know they're they're just um, the ones that are are physically stronger and better able to to bear and so pharaoh is afraid that there's going to be this uprising so he tries to be subtle at first and 
when that doesn't work, he throws all that out the window. He's like, you know what? Forget it. I'm just making it a command. And so he charges everybody. If you see a son that is born um, to the Hebrew people, you're going to cast it into the river. Uh, but you can leave the daughters alive. And so that's that's where the everything comes to a, a climax here. And you're going to see, see this uh, major shift in uh, the fortunes of the Hebrews during this time. And so there went out a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, uh, a daughter of Levi, and that's Amram uh, and Jacobeth. Uh, uh, and uh, the woman conceived and bare a son. Now this isn't her first son. Aaron has already. Aaron was born when all of this um, first round with the midwives is going on. So he's already there, uh, and she also has a daughter, and so. Uh, when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. So after he was born, she was able to hide the child for three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and laid it in the flags by the river's brink. So she, she kind of hides him in the rushes and, uh, lets him, and it, it's kind of, she's like, I can't hide him anymore. And so she's like, God, I'm going to trust you. She's not, she's not giving the child up for um, death. You know, kind of, you see this image in the um, Prince of Egypt where the basket's like tossed out on these waves. Well, we're on the Nile River here, not exactly an ocean with storms and stuff, um, although it is a, a fairly powerful river. Uh, and then you see all the alligators kind of reaching up, trying to bite it and stuff like that. I don't know that Moses was ever in that level of danger on the river um we don't see anything about that in the scriptures um so did she put him in the the flags or the the little reeds there uh very near to the where the princess was 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 this kind of a plan and so um you know uh, it's we're again speculation we don't know but uh it never it never says that moses is in any danger while he's in this basket so his sister stood afar off to wit that would be done to him, to see what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. Um, <clears throat> so this is this is very close to the same place. Uh, I don't even know that the basket moved or went anywhere. And, and I get the impression by reading this, the way that it's worded, is that uh, Jacobeth puts the, the basket into the water at the place where she maybe knows the princess comes. And so she puts the basket in the water and then goes away, but tells her daughter, you know, stay here and see what's going on. Or maybe just the daughter stays there and, and to watch to see what happens. And uh, so then here comes Pharaoh's daughter to the same place. And that's that's the image I get here. The, that, this is what I'm inferring from the scriptures that, that the basket didn't really go anywhere. Um, <clears throat> And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she opened it, she saw the child. So it, was, it had a lid, it, had a, it was closed up. She saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. So, you know, you can imagine this woman. She's walking along, she sees a basket, says, sends one of her servants out to get it, pulls open the lid, and there's this baby, and it starts crying. Motherly instinct just immediately takes over, and she's like, Aw, this baby, and she's crying, he's crying. This looks like one of the Hebrews' children, and she's like, you know, I'm not gonna let um, my dad's edict take this little baby. She she sees it right there, um, you know. Just when, when you talk about uh, abortion, and, and this this whole thing right here just lends itself to to this idea uh, of abortion. But there's a lot of states that um, have this law now that they're trying to to put in where they have to do ultrasounds. And the reasoning behind that is when you see the baby, it's a lot harder for you to, to, to take its life. And I think we see that here with Pharaoh's daughter. Um, she actually sees the baby and, you know, it's no longer a, a nameless, faith, faceless child of some other people. Here you have the this warm, cuddly, cute, crying baby right in front of you. And seeing it, it's real. And it's, it's no longer like a statistic. It's no longer a... a uh, a cold uh, law that's been passed. It's now a real life right in front of you. And I think that's, uh, that's where she has compassion on him. 
And so, uh, anyway, verse seven, this then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, so this is, this is Moses' uh, sister talking. Uh, then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? So Pharaoh's daughter, not having recently had a child, uh, is not able to nurse um, this three-month-old baby. And so the sister's like, hey, uh, I see you have a baby there that you got out of the river. Uh, why don't I go get one of the Hebrew women? You know, they've all lost their children, but a lot of them just have had, had children and, and they're able to nurse. You know, well, let me go get one of those. And then she can nurse the baby for you. Well, Pharaoh's daughter is like, well, that's, you know, that's a great idea. And um, so uh, anyway, uh, it says, uh, uh, verse 8, uh, Pharaoh's da daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, so this is talking to Moses' mother, um, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. So not only... Does Jacobeth get her son back to nurse under the protection of Pharaoh's daughter? Now she's getting paid for it. So, you know, total bonus there. Uh, hey, Arthur, welcome aboard. Um, so just really fortunate events that are happening here. Definitely the hand of God, the providence of God uh, is steering these events. So, so the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew and she brought him into Pharaoh's daughter. So after the nursing period is over, she brings him back to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So she adopts him and she called his name Moses. And Moses means drawn because she drew him out of the water. Hey, John, welcome aboard. Uh, we're in Exodus chapter two, verse 10. And she says, uh, I'm going to call his name Moses because I drew him out of the water. And that's what the word Moses means is drawn. Um, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren. Now, when we see this, <clears throat> uh, when we look at Moses, uh, particularly, uh, and I, I keep alluding back to the movies because media has such an influence on us. When we look at uh, Moses in The Prince of Egypt, he's still a young man. He looks to be like in his 20s. But if you... Uh, and, and we'll read further on. He's actually 40 years old when all of this starts to happen. Uh, he, he spends 40 years in Egypt. So he's, um, you know, he still lives well over 100 years. Um, but uh, a third of his entire life is spent in Egypt as a prince of Egypt here. So this isn't, this isn't something he does as a 20-year-old. It's just boom. No worries, Stephen. Welcome aboard. Glad to have you. Uh, and so, you know, he grew, he, he grows up, he, uh, he was there for a while, he's educated, he has all the, the privileges of growing up in the house of Pharaoh. He's, he's basically a prince, as the movie says, and he gets, he gets all of the, the benefits of, of that, the education and the, the, um, the food and just everything. He didn't have to deal with the, the back-breaking back slavery, but, but for the first few years, the developmental years of his life, he has his mother there, Jacobeth, to kind of introduce him to the Hebrew people. And so Moses knows he's a Hebrew. He knows where he comes from. And uh, so that's going to lead to what happens here. When Moses was grown, then he went out to his brethren, to his kinsmen, and looked on their burdens. So he's, he's out and he's kind of inspecting what all his... Uh, uh, his kinsmen are having to deal with. So remember, they've been now for 40 years, this has been going on um, uh, after all of this got started. So we're maybe 40, 45 years worth of this. It's basically a generation uh, in, in the Bible. Generations are roughly 40 years um, that, that this has all been going on. And he spied an Egyptian smiting, he's basically beating uh, a Hebrew, one of his kinsmen. In verse 12, it says, he looked this way and that way. And when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So he kind of looks around, doesn't see anybody, particularly Egyptians. And he kills the guy that's beating up the Hebrew. And Moses thinks he's doing a good thing. You know, he's protecting his own people. Uh, he's taking their side over the Egyptians that had raised him. And so he hides the body and he looked around and he didn't see anybody. But we're going to see that, that 
uh, people know. People know about it. Uh, whether the person that he saved uh, saw and spread the word or whether there were some people there that saw that jo that uh, Moses just didn't happen to see, somehow the word gets out. So verse 13, when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. So they're kind of, they're mad at each other. They're wrestling with one another and there's basically a fight. And he said to them that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? You know, why, why are you beating up your own, your own kinsmen? Why would you do that? And he said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? So this is, this is a good question because remember, at this time, they're still under this kind of patriarchal system. Now, the, the 12 uh, patriarchs of their lines have all died off. The, the families are, are exceedingly big. Lots of, of children and grandchildren uh, and even great-grandchildren at this point. Um, so we're talking hundreds upon hundreds of people, uh, you know, probably over the thousand mark by this time. Uh, and so uh, there's Moses is, is nobody to them, you know, um, probably maybe even a little bit of jealousy that they know who he is because he's been around for 40 years. He's been raised as as Pharaoh's daughter's son, so Pharaoh's grandson and, and had all of this um, benefit that they didn't have while they were doing this backbreaking work. And so that's their attitude. You know, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So he's calling him on it. You know, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And, you know, you can imagine the bitterness that these people felt while they were having to go through this, especially when, when Moses is one of them, but he's not having to do it. So I wondered if he really murdered the Egyptian, as some say, instead of running to the defense of his kinsmen. Well, it, it doesn't it doesn't even say murder. Um, it just it just says that he killed him. Uh, and hit him in the sand, but you know there's intent here. It says that he looked this way and in that way. When he saw there was no man, he killed the Egyptian. So there's, it's not like a, uh, it was a, uh, what you might call it. It wasn't just a momentary decision. It wasn't something where, um, if he didn't act immediately, the Egyptian was going to kill the Hebrew. He was just beating him, just like a taskmaster, a taskmaster. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, for him to step in and, and defend his kinsman, <laughs> oh, tickle in the nose, <clears throat> to defend his kinsman that, that way, uh, I think, uh, you know, there's a little bit of premeditation in there. Um, was it murder? Um, you know, what what does what does murder mean? I I think his intent to defend his kinsman was a noble intent. Um, why Why did he have to go all the way to killing the Egyptian? You know, we don't know the circumstances. We weren't told the circumstances. Um, there isn't a reason to defend Moses. Um, the, you know, there's there's no argument that that Moses uh, was allegedly sinless. You know, we, we know that he sinned uh, multiple times. It talks about it uh, throughout these these books here. And that's one of the great things about the Bible is the Bible doesn't pull punches about its, its, its main characters. <laughs> You know, when, when they sin, when they have flaws, the Bible highlights those. It, it describes them as, as, as humans. And so, um, you know, did Moses commit murder here? It kind of looks like it. Um, but we just, we, we don't have the full thing. You know, if we, if we were to try Moses in a court of law based on this amount of information, I don't think he could be convicted of murder um, if, if we're going to go that far down to the details. So, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> But anyway, uh, the, the Hebrew asked, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? And Moses was afraid and said, surely everybody knows about it. If these guys know about it, then I guess everybody knows. And so he's afraid now. And so now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. Now, again, you look at the prince of Egypt, and I don't, I don't remember. That it's been a long time since I've seen the Ten Commandments. But you, you look at uh, uh, the prince of Egypt, what happens? The, the young Ramses tries to, he hears about it and he's like, come on, we can make it like this never happened. See, he's not, he's not, um, you know, Moses is, 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 is essentially his brother and he tries to sweep it under the rug in the movie. But in, here in the uh, scriptures, as soon as Pharaoh hears about it, he's, he's seeking to, to kill Moses. 
you know, there's there's no uh, there, there there isn't any period of time in here where where uh, they try to sweep it under the rug or they give Moses anything. You know, he's a Hebrew. Hebrew is a Hebrew, and I think Moses also kind of sees here just how much clout he actually has, which is none because of who he is and what he is. Um, yeah, no, I agree with you, Stephen. That's that, that's the point I was making. Is that that. Uh, like I said, if we were to put Moses on trial based only on the information here in the text, uh, I don't I don't think we would have enough to, to convict him of murder. Um, I think it looks more like he was defending somebody else. Um, but he did think about it. He did spend some time uh, thinking about it. So uh, maybe possibly at the most manslaughter. Uh, but... But I don't. I don't think that the intent there. That you know, we talk about motive when we when we convict somebody of murder. There has to be the motive there, and I don't think his motive was sufficient for murder. So I think I think you're right about that. So anyway, um, verse fifteen. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. Remember, Midian was one of the children of Ishmael, and so these are the Ishmaelites. Uh, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their uh, father's flock. Uh, <clears throat> and the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So you can imagine these these there's these seven girls, and uh, you have the, they're they're trying to feed their father's flock, but it's just seven girls, and so when they come to this well all the the male shepherds that are there they're like no no you know back off and there's this kind of this manly thing they're you know you just you wait and they they kind of shove them off and it looks like this is something that they deal with a lot uh, because you know uh, their father is going to be uh, uh, asking them hey you guys got back fast today what happened and so uh when this happens this time moses happens to be there and moses stands up for him he, he kind of runs off the, uh, or, or, or prevents the shepherds from running them off. And he helps the girls uh, and waters their flock. And so when they came to Raul, their father, he said, how is it that you are come so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And so Raul is, is like, uh, you know, how did you, how did you get back so fast? You usually are, are gone a lot longer than this when you're watering the flock. And so they explain, and he said unto his daughters, and where is he? And why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter. So we fast forward a little bit here. <laughs> we have, uh, you know, he's at the well and like, you know, where's he at? Did you leave him? Invite him in for dinner. And the next thing you know, Moses is married to one of his daughters. So, um, Time passes, you know, this is kind of that fast forward thing. We're not going to, we're not going to get into the, the whole, uh, details in between, um, as a, as a writer, one of the things I, I've learned dealing with, uh, uh, writing a, a story is you only, you only put in the story, the things that matter. Uh, you know, if somebody's, if somebody's going to eat dinner and you need them to eat dinner and that's important, you don't describe them doing every little thing to prepare for dinner and walking to the table and getting out the silverware and all. It's boring. Nobody wants to read that. And so, uh, that's kind of what, what Moses does here. He's like, yep. Uh, I met him and I helped, uh, at the well. And the next thing I was married to one of them. <laughs> so here we are. Um, so she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. And so uh, if you uh, look at the name Gershom, pull this up here, not too many things going on in my thing here. Uh, foreigner is what Gershom means. And uh, uh, Gershom is also the firstborn son of Levi. And that's interesting because, remember, this would have been a well-known name uh, because Kohath is Moses's grandfather and Kohath's brother is Gershom. So Kohath has an older brother, Gershom, and then Kohath has Amram, Amram has Moses. So this isn't, this isn't just a kind of a random name here. Moses is like, you know, I'm going to name him Gershom because I'm a stranger in a strange land, but this is also his great uncle's name, um, which I thought was pretty cool. 
And it came to pass in a process of time that the king of Egypt died. So this is the this is the really mean one that uh, wanted wanted to kill all the babies. Uh, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. So that that word sigh there is it's not a sigh of relief. Um, it's they're continuing to groan that the new the Pharaoh that comes next um, doesn't let up. And so they're, they're, they're crying out, they're groaning under the, the bondage. And so their cry comes up unto God by reason of the bondage and God heard their groaning. See, there's that, that word groan. Um, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. Not that God forgot. It's that God is, is bringing it to the forefront because he's ready to do something. Uh, God is omniscient. He doesn't forget anything. And then, Oh, I'm sorry. I totally forgot you guys were in Egypt. That's, that's not what he's saying here. He's, he, it's, Moses is writing that God is, is bringing this to the forefront of events and he was about to do something about it. So God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. He's, he's seeing them uh, and uh, he is hearing their cries and he's about to do something about it. So uh, that's setting the stage is, is kind of what these two chapters do is they prepare us uh, they introduce us to Moses, the great deliverer, um, and uh, he, you know, he he's he's introduced to us. We we get the first forty years of his life. We see the Israelites go from these special people that that had high standing in Egypt uh, under one Pharaoh, and suddenly, next generation they're slaves. Um, but it's not it's not long, long, like many generations as I had originally thought when I was a lot younger. So, um, yes, exactly. So yeah, Stephen is exactly right. When God remembers something, it's not cause he forgot. It's the writer saying, and God remembered something meaning he's about to do something about it. <laughs> so, um, and then when God doesn't remember something, um, uh, you know, he talks about that the God will remember our sins no more for the sake of Christ um, means he's not going to do anything about it. Uh, it's not that God can forget. He's, he's again, omniscient. It's not that suddenly he doesn't recall that we ever sinned. It's that because of Christ now, he remembers our sins no more. He doesn't bring it to the forefront to do anything about it. He, he's forgiven those sins. There's an absolute real forgiveness um, that we can't find in the Old Testament, that they couldn't achieve in the Old Testament because the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do that. So, uh, Denna, you have joined us as we are about to end here. We just finished Exodus 1 and 2. Uh, I do appreciate you coming on board. Uh, I hope you take time and, and head back through and, and watch uh, on the replay. I will also be posting this up, uh, probably not tonight, but uh, when I get a few videos, it's easier to post them up in chunks. Uh, just because it's it's a quick process if I do a lot of them. But uh, anyway, I hope you catch it on the, the replay here on Facebook, uh, or you could subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's Swordmaster Publications. Uh, and that's also the name of my website. It's uh, swordmasterpublications.fandom.com. And I uh, appreciate you guys being here tonight, and uh, very excited. We're into our next book of the Bible. Only uh, 65 more to go. So <laughs> y'all have a great night.